worship team makes its way up here. As the rest of the worship team makes its way up here. Got a couple thoughts for you. And those thoughts are this. After the next set of worship, as I get ready to preach and we have our offering, I'm going to send this around again. This is the bowling sign-up. I'm not going to say it's the last week, but it's pretty close. Okay, if you're interested in bowling, okay? Um, and then, oh, that's right, racing. You want to come up here, kiddo? Come on up. Um, as you look at this, these are all the teams that are signed up to bowl that have said in parentheses, we'll get a team, or here's the, the team. So there are a few of you that I'm not sure if you do have a team or not. So what I'd like you to do is as it comes to you, please look for your name and make sure that you tell me and confirm, yes, we will have a team. All righty? And then there's a good group down here, a good solid group that are uh, maybe not going to bowl, but they are going to uh, help sponsor or work with someone uh, that's on this list up here to maybe sponsor a family, okay? So please make sure you look through this. If your name's not there and you want to bowl or you want to participate, please sign in up here, okay? Gracie. Who is this? I don't know if you know Gracie, but Gracie has one of the best handshakes I've ever experienced. Okay, first time I ever shook hands with her, I was not ready for the handshake that she gives. It's just real solid, man. Anyway, she's involved in karate, right? And uh, we, you guys, are her church fan, are her family, really. You're not just her church family, but your family. And so, in this case, what I wanted to do, and Lewis asked if it would be okay, and I think it is, if Gracie announced what she's involved with right now, but raising funds, right? Can I go for it? Um, my family and I are selling popcorn, killing popcorn and stuff for um, karate to help us get to our competition. Yeah, that's not weird. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Did you say, yeah, that's not weird? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just Start over, because I think I distracted from the whatever your announcement was. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> but she's going to bring it in. Yeah. You can okay. eat it during service if you want some. <laughs> That's an awesome idea.
time, sing it out. church. 
you need to be doing this. And, and not only do you need to, you need to not just because you're a pastor, but because of what it will do for your heart. And that has been an absolute blessing. So this has been a part of that. Not only uh, uh, kind of the foundational, which we're going to talk about today, the foundational aspects of being a Christian, uh, but praying for one another, and also being prepared for his, his coming back, being ready for that. Um, and I mentioned this last week, uh, that as you all prepared for Thanksgiving, and I know you all did, in some way, shape, or form, you all prepared. Now you're preparing for Christmas. You're getting ready for it. Um, what Paul is wanting us to remind ourselves about, and to be mindful of each and every day, is to take that kind of mindset every day you walk this planet, being prepared for, one, his coming back, or you're going home. One of those two is a part of every day, possibly. So when we read through this, uh, I'm going to start at the very first verse in, in 1 Thessalonians, again, chapter 1. It is the greeting that Paul gives this group of believers and the powerful nature of what it should convey to you and I as Christians, as believers, as those who call themselves followers and disciples of Christ and what is entailed with that. And then we're going to get into this whole aspect of some of the foundational components of being a disciple of following Jesus and what that means and what the practical applications are as we gear up for communion this morning. So if you don't, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to start with Paul's greeting, which I always like because it's just such a powerful way to send a letter out to someone. And it says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, Grace to you and peace. This was fairly common greetings in letters in, those, in these days, particularly in Greece and for, uh, uh, for that area and region, is to greet each other like that. But to say grace, grace to you and peace. What a good way to start a letter to someone. It says in verse 2, which is where we spent most of our time last week, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work, of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of, all, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. We're going to start in verse 4 for the rest of the day, but first of all, just to recapture something. If you have, if you have a pen with you, I'd suggest that you uh, underline, circle some things, okay, some things that are very important. And that is, he says, uh, bearing in mind, making these prayers in verse 3, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. This goes directly to James. Okay? The, the importance of our faith is made evidence in our work. The value of our faith, the existence of our faith, is made evident and demonstrated in our works. We cannot work our way to heaven. All we need to do is believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, accept Him as such, and then follow Him. What comes with that is the nature of the Holy Spirit working in us to move us to serve, to move us to love others well. But in this case, it says your work of faith. That it was evident to people around that these were believers because of how they worked out and exercised their faith. I think that's a powerful part of this. Then he says, and labor of love. Labor of love. Those of you who are married, have been married, raise your hands. How many of you would say that it is a labor of love? Every wife went like this. It is a labor of love to live with someone 24-7 every day. It is a labor also of joy as we experience that. It is a labor of love to love those that you work with, your neighbors. We, Jennifer and I are surrounded uh, where we live is a flag lot, so all around, or all around us are different properties. I would say 99% of them have dogs that do not know that it's 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it's a labor of love for me to lay there in bed and go, oh man, praise those neighbor's dogs. <laughs> it's just so nice to have them nearby, you know? And I, I gotta tell you this in jest, only because I haven't found them yet, but I, there's times when we have a great game. And I really have been tempted, this is your pastor speaking out of the flesh, I guess, to record Tila, to get her excited by ready to chase that ball and have her just bark and record every bark. And then every time I hear a dog out at night, take those speakers out and send them outside and broadcast 
to you. I've got one too. <laughs> but a labor of love. It's hard to love everybody. It's hard to love people. And in the flesh, we cannot do it. So Paul is saying, not only your work of faith, but your labor of, love, of loving others well is evident, as he's going to talk about here, that it's a labor to love others well. It is work. It's an effort. And in our own, in our own ways, it's almost impossible. But with the work of the Holy Spirit, as he's going to talk about here shortly, as we start in verse 4 shortly, and that it is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. As a, as a disciple, a follower of Christ, you and I are incapable of witnessing effectively without the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We can't love well. We don't serve well because we get selfish with the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. So Paul wants them to understand that we remember this, bearing in mind your works of faith, your labor of love, and then the last one, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. He taught them very firmly, as we have heard, not only in our body, but in any church you've probably been in, is that is that Jesus will return. When, we don't know. That is not ours to worry about. Ours to worry about or to be aware of is being prepared for that. Being prepared for his arrival or our arrival to him. So Paul wants them to understand that, man, we love you, and understand that you are being great models, witnesses, ambassadors of who Christ is, of the gospel message. And that's the message to you and I as we read that. How are your works of faith? How is your labor of love going? And is your steadfastness of hope that which keeps you on the rails of a disciple following Christ? That hope in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Paul wants us to understand that. And then we're going to talk about the rest of the day is thriving as a disciple. Not just existing as a disciple, but thriving. Those of you who've been here for a little while, here's a test. Which verse is the one that I said is probably the theme song for this entire letter? Does anybody remember? Ooh, there's a test. If I were a good teacher, I'd say your exit ticket to get out of here would be to quote this, right? No. It is that aspect in chapter 4 that says, and I'm going to read it, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more that you may excel still more. Do not be content to sit still. Do not be content just to exist as a Christian. Do not be content to just say, I believe, and let it go at that. Because even the demons believe. That is the difference between you and I, and that is that when we believe, the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to take over its powerful presence in our life. Getting rid of the old bill. Every day is a purposeful effort on my behalf to allow the Holy Spirit to take over so that I might become more Christ-like. And in doing so, I am moved for works of faith, to love better, and to have a steadfast hope that is only in Jesus Christ. So we are encouraged to excel more. Again, I, I'm going to drive this home. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot have works replace faith. Jesus is what gets us into eternal life. Our belief, our walk with Him, our conviction to live with and for Him, not our works, but they work hand in hand, as Paul has said here. So we're going to talk about thriving as a disciple. Thriving as someone who thinks this week will be better than last week. I will be changed to be a better disciple this week. Not through my own efforts, although I have to discipline myself to be purposeful and passionate to follow my Jesus, but also to allow the Holy Spirit to work on me so that I can love my wife better, I can love you better, I can love those that I work with better, I can love those around my neighborhood better. That is what God calls us to, and that is what Paul wants these guys to understand. So we're going to start in verse 4. Verse 4, and I'll continue in verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. There's some powerful aspects of our walk with Christ that are there. First of all, you and I are called by God. It's a destiny. It is an aspect of, 
of God's plan. And, it, and some of you might be thinking, well, how come he just called me and he didn't call these other people in my life? How come he hasn't called others? When in fact, here's the, the, the funny part about it, is he calls everyone. Not everyone hears his voice. Not everyone responds to the call. How many of you are, don't raise your hand by this, how many of you are guilty of getting a phone call, looking at it and going, I'm not ready for that yet. Everybody in here, I'm sure, has done that, unless your pastor is solely alone in that. <laughs> now, I just kind of laid bare that sometimes this is not going to happen. If you call me, I'll answer. But if I don't answer, don't go, he's looking at the phone and seeing it's me. Please don't do that. Okay? I'm not doing it. Um, unless I'm busy with something. But God calls everybody who's ever walked on this planet, but not everybody responds. I'm going to say a name that from all writings responded and gave his life to Christ. Jeffrey Dahmer. You all know that name? Oh, can you believe that? He's going to sit at the table with us if what we found out or what we've read about is true. But he gave his life to Christ in jail just before he died. That's hard to believe, isn't it? That is, you guys sang the song of, of, of the reckless love of our God. That is the reckless love of God calling on anybody who's willing to hear. And as he knocks on the door of our heart, are we willing to open, our, open the doors of our heart and allow him in? That is the incredible aspect of grace of our God. That's phenomenal to think about. So we have this, this God who loves us and has called him. And, he, and Paul wants these guys to understand that you have first been pursued by God. You and I have been pursued by God, the hound of heaven, all of our life. And those who in your family or neighbors or friends or whatever family members that are not with Christ yet, the hound of heaven is still pursuing and will not quit. Now, not all of them will maybe hear it or respond. That is a reality of human nature, of us as uh, people who have the will to make a decision, the free will to decide to follow or not. But thriving disciples realized that it was God who called me first, and I responded to him. Second part of that is that because of that, we have the assurance that a God who always loves us, God who was always consistent with his love for us and his grace to forgive us, and that truth of how much he loved us is played out in our relationship with him. We have the assurance of peace and joy. I was talking to a gentleman, uh, Jennifer and I grabbed a, a, a new piece of furniture for our, our house out at Model Home Furnishing. I was talking with a man in the warehouse. And um, he said, are you the pastor? And Jennifer told him when I came to pick up this item, he said, are you the pastor? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm the pastor. Um, and he says, uh, I might come to your church sometime. He started telling me a little bit about his, his life with his two kids. And I said, well, what are you looking for in a church? And, and he said, peace. He's looking for peace. Because when we walk with Christ, as we walk further and deeper in our relationship with him, we experience a deeper sense of peace. And, and keep your finger in 1 Thessalonians. And if you want to, please do turn back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 gives us the essence of how, how our walk with Christ can produce this assurance, this aspect of peace and joy in our life, and helps us to thrive, helps us to thrive as a disciple, knowing that we have been first called by him, we picked up the receiver and said yes, and then we continue to respond to him and follow him. And there's how we follow him. Uh, chapter 3 of Proverbs, I'm going to start in verse 13, uh, 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up, and the skies dripped with dew. My son, let them not depart from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul. In other words, keep picking up the phone. Keep picking up the aspect of God's voice to us, and that's this item right here, this scripture. This item called the Word of God, the truth of God, that we pick it up every day to look at it, to listen to God's voice to us, so that we can wear it around our neck, so that we can wear it around as a coat, a cloak, to carry us through the day. It says, so they will, in verse 22, so they will be life to your soul and an adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely, 
and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. That is the peace that I think that gentleman and all of us seek. seek. And we thrive in that kind of element when we walk and begin our day with God's voice. We pick up the receiver. What do you got for me today? In prayer and in reading his word. We talked about last week as we pray. Beginning with thanksgiving, God, for everything that goes on in our life. And some of you might be thinking, Bill, you don't know how bad my life is. And I don't. God does. I know that. But I would be willing to venture that our lives might be a skosh better than other people's lives if we take the time to look around. If we look around just a little bit. There's a, a movie that's called The Highwaymen that it is about um, more of an accurate story of the search for Bonnie and Clyde. And these two um, ex-Texas um, Rangers are after them. And they go into this place that's called Hell's, um, Hell's Porchyard, or Hell's, um, I can't remember, Porchyard Front Yard, something like that. And it's all these homeless people <coughs> living in their cars and stuff like that. And the one guy who is his partner um, one of the, uh, the government agents. He's looking at this, and his, as he's looking at people who are homeless, living in their cars, living on the, on the ground, and he said, I thought my life was bad. I'm not saying that we compare, but we always gotta remember that somebody's life is always better, somebody's life is always worse. And what this passage tells me is that when you lie down, if our focus is on the circumstances, you're gonna toss and turn. If our life and our mind is focused on Jesus Christ and the peace that he brings, we will be able to lie down and your sleep will be sweet. That is the practice, that is the daily discipline of us as disciples to thrive in the midst of, of persecution, in the midst of difficulties and the circumstances that can weigh on us. These disciples, if you ever want to read about uh, what was going on at the time of this letter being written to the Thessalonian church, you should read about it. The intensity of the persecution of both Jews and believers was absolutely through the roof. It wasn't like us here, where we wake up and we think, well, maybe I'll go to church, maybe I won't. It's not really that important. Um, it's not really that important that I pray or that I visit or that I talk about or that I serve others that much. It's not that important that I go to this house where there's persecution if I'm found going there. These folks had that threat all the time of being found out. That's why Paul wanted them to hear this letter, to receive this letter, to encourage them. Man, I know how you're doing. I know of your works. I know of what's going on in your life. I believe in you. We're praying for you. We're keeping up at night, keeping you in our prayers. He wants them to understand that. So you and I, one, have that assurance that Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit resides in us to help us to thrive, not just to exist as believers. There's plenty of churches, there's plenty of people who call themselves Christians who are existing. They don't threaten the enemy at all. I've said this before many times in our church family here, and that is when you woke up this morning and your feet hit the ground, did the enemy go, uh-oh, he or she is up. We better get busy. As a thriving disciple of Christ, you and I can cause the enemy to shake because you're up. We're up. Or did he just kind of roll over and go to sleep and go, don't worry about them. They're not effective. They're not winning anybody. They're not loving well. All those kinds of things. Paul wants us to understand in this church in Thessalonica to understand we need to thrive. That's why I wrote that passage in, in the earlier or the, the, uh, in the later chapter about excel all the more so that the enemy has no chance. So what are disciples going to do? Verses 6 through 7. Let's read that. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. I'm back in 1 Thessalonians, sorry. My, my wife's voice, I could hear in my mind just now. Because I, I left Proverbs a while ago, and I, I went back here, but I didn't tell you. So I'm back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I started in verse 6 here. He's talking about the gospel and so forth. But you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation. Please, when you see the word tribulation, he's not just talking about a bad cold. He's not talking about a bad moment with finances. He's talking about a constant barrage of persecution. 
Much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Again, our joy, our peace does not come from ourselves. It comes from the Holy Spirit and a close walk with Him. So that you became an example to all the believers, and not just in these two towns, but all over Europe. These guys, these, this group of believers became imitators and then as an example. So you and I, as believers, one of the essences, uh, essence, uh, the nature, the natural essence of us as believers is to be one, followers of those who are examples. Followers of those who are good examples. We have no excuse in our world today to follow great examples, whether it's on the television, whether it is um, uh, uh, paper mentors, books that we read, whether it's the opportunity to go to a church of our choice. Not that I'm a good example. But if I don't preach the Word of God, I've always told you this, if you don't hear this when you come here, I'm not a good example. This is the example through what we speak as, the, as, as pastors. But these folks were saying, were saying that thriving disciples are first imitators. They follow that which attracts them. Okay? You, hear, you are here because there's not just the Word of God, but there's also a great worship and there's the fellowship of one another. That is what attracts you. The disciples, when Jesus came alongside them and said, drop your nets and follow me. Those who heard, those who saw, and those who felt something different in this man's voice and in his countenance said, I'm done with that. And they followed Jesus. Now those men dropped the nets of their careers, their lifeblood, their, um, their financial gain. They dropped those nets. For everybody else that he's talking to through those through that uh, story, it's what net do you hang on to? What net? It is a net of pornography. It is is it a net of anger? Is it a net of selfishness? It is a, is it a net of a lack of forgiveness? Whatever the net happens to be, Jesus says, drop that net and follow me, so that your sleep your sleep will be sweet so that you will experience deep joy and profound peace. Be first imitators. Follow that which is effective. And the only effective model is Jesus Christ. It's the only effective message there is, a model that there is. Now, I, I love to listen to Francis Chan. He's one of my video and paper mentors. I love listening to his, his in-your-face, loving nature of sermon and speaking. You and I are called to follow those who lead. I, uh, 36 years ago, actually it was probably 37 years ago, I met someone who I wanted to follow. It took me a while to realize this. But I met her on the campus of LCSC. I saw Jennifer walking across the campus. I was heading home and I saw this incredibly beautiful woman walking by. And I went, <laughs> a long time. There was something about her. Obviously, it was her, her countenance. It was her beauty that drew me in. But it was deeper than that that caused me to come back to her as we both went our separate ways. Her to Minneapolis, Florida, New York. Me goofing around with a hardball called baseball. And then that great sport called hackers. <laughs> okay. Fortunately, God said, hey, back to where you first followed. And it was her followed her. She was my I don't know, my rock. I don't know how many times I would find her and call her just to say, how are you? There was something about her that caused me to want to follow her. And I'm so glad that she was still around and still interested in me a, a few years later. We are, we follow that which grabs our attention. Has Jesus grabbed your attention? If he has, keep following. Follow him through all the breadcrumbs, and these sometimes are not breadcrumbs, these sometimes are whole loaves of bread that say, here, in your face. Sometimes they're here, you need this morsel of food, the comfort, the encouragement, the strength. Sometimes it's conviction. I don't know if you know the name Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel, a devout atheist, I'm going to say most of his life. His, wife name, his wife's name was Leslie Strobel. Gave her life to Jesus Christ in 1978, Lived out her faith every day with an atheist in the house and a five-year-old daughter. But not just an atheist, but I'm talking about an extreme, argumentative, professing kind of atheist who was extremely intelligent. 
and could, tr could threaten any believer if they don't know the word of God. She just kept loving him. Kept loving him. Kept loving him. And so did our God. A couple years later, about three years later, 1981, as Lee Strobel said, you know what? I'm going to prove that it's, it's fake. And he investigated, the researched the uh, scriptures. And as a result of that, he became a Christian. He came face to face with the reality of Jesus Christ as the only way. The reality of the gospel truth message and became a Christian and has since produced books, after, many, many books about the case for Christ. Phenomenal books. You and I, when I, I tell our folks who are going to become teachers, and teachers are the, you know, to me, the backbone of what we do in this country. But I tell them, before you think about you wanting to become a teacher, okay, you need to know that everybody's eyes are on you all the time. You are always being watched. You are always on display. You are a role model. People are imitating. People are watching. People are watching. And, you know, some of you who are teaching currently, there are now some of your students who have left your elementary, junior, or high school who are now coming into our program. And I always ask him, can you think of teachers who were, you wondered, why in the world are you teaching? You don't even love being with us. And they all go like this. And then I think, can you think of those who impacted your life because they made you feel important and significant? And I hear from people. I think I told, did I tell, I don't know if I told the story, but about a guy named Mr. Alfred. <laughs> at Lincoln Middle School. I've heard more stories about Mr. Alfred <laughs> the last semester than I have in a long time. And I love every one of them. Because the two girls who have been in his class, when I said, who are the folks, who are the teachers that impacted you in a great way? Can you think of those great teachers? Yeah, yeah Mr. Alfred. You impact people beyond measure, Mike. You two. Melissa Warren. Where's my other teachers at? Dory. You impact people all the time as a teacher. As a teacher, Beth, I know you were impacting kids all the time. Linda, they're missing your impact right now, but they are impacted by you as a teacher. Deb Coots, as teachers, as folks who are in the classroom. This is the other story I heard, because I was talking about Idaho still being a state of, uh, where you can have corporal punishment. What's <laughs> going like this? <laughs> I love this because I was talking about that Idaho still is a state of corporal punishment. You can still spank in this state. Now, some of you teachers are teaching the state going, really? Cool. I'm freaking the paddle, man. Anyway, I told them a story about my junior high teacher down in Blackfoot, Idaho, who was a former football player in college. Big lineman. He was a principal at junior high, and this man had a two fisted handle and a paddle that was about that wide, about that thick. About that long. And that wasn't enough for this guy. He, what he did is he drilled holes in it to make it more aerodynamically efficient. <laughs> Second thing he did, he said, I want to make sure there's a better impact. So he drilled length of, length of the board almost and put steel rods in it. <laughs> wow. Now, Mike didn't do this. Please understand that. <laughs> but I experienced it once. And man, it hurt. I didn't want to disobey ever again. So afterwards, they said, Mr. Alfred has some paddles uh, up on his wall, right, Mike? <laughs> I asked him, I said, if you ever go back over there, take some pictures of it. I want to see it. I love the fact that here is the looming presence of discipline. <laughs> um, you impact people because people are watching you all the time. As Christians, the moment you leave this building, people are watching you. Not so, in some cases, not to be encouraged, but to point and say, see, they're fake. And that's the enemy at work. If we are not following the gospel truth and not being empowered by Christ, we will fall short always, but we won't be able to pick ourselves back up. And people love it when Christians fall. Sometimes even in churches, fellow believers enjoy when someone falls. And I don't understand that. Churches should not be a battleground, but they end up being a battleground where people get shot and hurt. And, and I'm not talking about the physical, I'm talking about the spiritual, where people take joy and people fall in. This should be a hospital that every one of us need triage every time we walk in here. 
We need to be bandaged up, encouraged, and sent back out ready to do more. Ready to excel all the more when we walk out into the world. You and I are both following the good models and our models for others to follow. And he wants us to understand that. That the only way we can do that is to understand our role as an ambassador for Christ. And the only way we can do that is if we are in the word and following what it is that he says to us. I'm going to read verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia or Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. I love this, that when we go out there, we are witnesses for Christ, and every now and then we speak. When we go out, people are watching every move we make, how we love, how we encourage, every now and then how we speak. I think the young, the young um, person who followed Francis of Assisi, said he was one of the greatest preachers he's ever heard. And occasionally he spoke. That's the model of action. The model of loving others well. You folks, i got to tell you this, that every time we bowl, your model, your example, is left behind at Orchard's Lane. Because every time I call them, whenever I happen to go in to set this up, oh, we love having you guys, and you're such a great group of people. Love having them all here. They're having so much fun. You leave a message with every frame you bowl. When we go to, and we volunteer at the World Series over at LCSC, they love having us there. But when, they, when I leave, or we, we leave, and I come around, I'm talking to Happy Days, I'm talking to the World Series Committee, they love the fact that Grand Lake Community Church is in there. They love the fact that we will gather around before we start our shift and pray. And sometimes those happy day folks, in fact, last year it was the happy day guy that was there that said, Bill, are you guys going to pray? We were starting to get busy and it was the happy day guy that said, hey, are you, you going to pray? And I was like, duh, absolutely we're going to pray. So we are an impactful church because we follow a good model, and that is Christ, and that we become imitators of what we see. The last thing I'm going to read is this, and it's going to lead us to communion. I'm going to start in verse 9. And you see, again, he's still talking about those who are witnesses, those in Thessalonica who are, who are um, being models for folks to follow. And he says, for they themselves reported about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. I'm going to stop there. This should probably be the first thing on all of us. I mentioned earlier that we are called to drop our nets, whatever those nets might be. Nets of selfishness, nets of apathy. God revealed to me that apathetic moment, or a moment, my apathy about praying for you. And I'm telling you, I have absolutely enjoyed praying for you. I've rarely missed a day of praying for you. I love the fact that that has been my prompt. You and I are called to that. Still, nobody's, I don't think anybody's asked me yet, because I asked you three weeks ago to say, next, if you ask me, are you praying for us? And if I don't say yes, you better get after me. So far, if you were to ask me, I would say, yes, I am. But what did I also say? Yes, I am. Are you? Are you? Are you praying for this church? We need prayer that covers this building physically and spiritually. That comes from you and I. The essence of our walk with Christ is made different, made different with how much we depend upon our God's powerful Holy Spirit's presence to carry out our life, to be able to love well, to be able to live a life that reflects who Jesus Christ is so that we might be a reflection to the lost who are out there who need that. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to keep reading, but I'm, I looked at the clock and it's 11 20, and I'm that I need to be done. Um, we're going to have communion now. Kim, would you mind just playing in the background for me? Um, I don't know what net you're holding on to. Not sure what that might be. But if there is a net in your hand, an idol, so to speak, that you don't want to let go of, I'm going to ask you to let go of it today before you walk out to this table. 
One of the things that Jesus calls us to do is to be imitators of him with the Lord's Supper, with communion. Because you and I serve a God who willingly went to the cross, knowing full well that you and I would fall short. Yet he still crawled onto the cross and saw my face. And said it's worth it. He saw your face. And said it's absolutely worth it. Beaten. Almost completely empty of fluid and blood. He willingly, that's the model we have, you know. He willingly went to the cross and let them nail him to the cross. And he also forgave them. Hang on the cross. He forgave them. Because they didn't know what they were doing. You and I know what we're doing. My question is, are you thriving? Or are you just existing? Paul says, do all the more to excel. Raise the bar. Raise the bar of being a Christian that is thriving and depending upon close relationship with one another, but also close relationship with Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray as we get ready to receive communion. I want you just to take some time thinking about any nets that you're holding on to. Nets that interfere with a close relationship with our God, your Savior. Whatever those nets might be, take some time to ponder it. Some of you are, how come he's laughing, man? Because this is a danger area over here. 
here. It's narrow, and I apologize for that. We've had many people go down. Okay, so I'm sitting over here to try to catch you if you fall, but also just to remind you to be watchful as you go through here. That side as well. There's some some small, what are those, about eight inch high uh, floors over on that side. So when you when you've had communion, don't forget about the fact that there are obstacles in our church. Just be mindful of that, okay? So when you're ready, come on up and solemnly, but also with incredible joy, enjoy communion together.
that hope that we have that lets us do that. Amen? Amen. All right. Gracie is in the back. If she has, uh, I think she has bags of popcorn, right, Gracie? Yeah. Good deal. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Okay. Mike, did I did I forget something? No. Nope. Okay. God bless you.